All right, I'm going to do a video here answering frequently asked questions about the house church movement. And uh, I thought instead of answering each of these individually, it'd be a good idea to just, to just make a video answering everything. And uh, so that's what we're going to do here. And uh, we're going to do a slightly different format with this. I don't have any sermon notes, nothing, just my Bible and myself. And behind the camera is my wife, Sister Catherine. And uh, she's going to read the questions, and I'm going to answer them as best I can. And I'm going to probably refer to some scriptures, and instead of actually saying, okay, let's turn in our Bibles, because I want to keep this thing moving, I'm actually just going to post the scriptures up here on the screen, okay, as text. You'll see the scriptures where these things are listed at, okay? So, with that said, what's the first question? What is a church? What is a church? That's a, that seems like a very simple question, but it, actually there's a lot to it. Um, what is a church? A church is the people, okay? The church is the body of Christ. You will never find any references in Scripture to a church being a building that people go to, that both saved and lost go to. And uh, you say, well, what, what difference does it make? If the church meets in a building. Uh, yeah, but you see, here's the problem. When a church starts to meet in a building, they start to associate the building as being the church, even though they'll say, well, no, it's the people. And, you know, there's a whole thing that goes along with that. You start to say, well, I go to church to hear preaching. I go to church to hear, to be taught the Word of God and everything else. And so you divorce your normal daily life with church. Church is not your normal daily life. It's some place you go to two or three times a week. See, that's a problem. That's a big problem. That's why we don't call the buildings churches. We call them Babel buildings or Baal buildings or phallus houses or whatever else. We call them different names. We don't call them churches. Okay, and of course you can look up every reference in the New Testament to the word church. You will not find one time that it refers to a building. Okay, next question. If we meet at home, won't we be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together? Oh boy. This is another good one. This, is, this one is the one that you're going to get from people that go to the Babel buildings they're going to throw that at you and just kind of smugly go, oh, we got you, you know. And you say, where's this found at? Well, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Okay, now, in context, what you see there in context is the Hebrews... You know, it's what the book's called, the Jews that are in the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day approaching? Does that mean that they should be worshiping at night? And, you know, so much the more as they see it getting to be morning? Well, of course not. What it's talking about is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's going to be very important to exhort one another to stay faithful until Jesus Christ comes back. But ironically, the people that meet in the Babel buildings are actually disobeying that very verse right there that they try to put on you as a house church Christian. You say, how so? Well, very simple. The verse says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Ourselves is saved people. It's not saved and lost. And so these big battle buildings, they go and they, they say, hey, bring all the lost in, you know, bring them in, bring them in, you know. Then you're disobeying Hebrews 10.25. And again, think about this. You have Christians meeting together in a home. Are you forsaking the assembling of yourself together with other believers? No. Then why would they throw that verse at you? See? And here's a little thing that you can throw back at them. Uh, when they say, you know, you say, they say, oh, where do you where do you fellowship at? Where do you worship at? You say, oh, I worship at home with some other, you know, brethren. Oh, well, you're forsake, forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. You say, oh, uh, no, we're actually assembling together. Yes, but you don't have a real church. Say, okay, did people 400 years ago have a real church? Could you please provide some documentation? Who were the people that were meeting in the uh, Babel buildings 400 years ago? Bible-believing Christians didn't meet in Babel buildings 400 years ago. 300 years ago, they had the first, you know, Baptist uh, Babel building built, and that, you know, I've, that's in my IFBC study. 
you can hear about that. It was it was financed by a state lottery, the oldest Baptist building in the United States. You know, and I, I mean, you look at these things. And another one that you can throw out these these people that that worship their building. Can you prove to me one building that has remained strong in the faith after a hundred years? You know, the Bible says, if this work or this council be of men, it will come to naught. The Babel buildings all come to naught. Every single one of them. You can't show me one Bible-believing Babel building out there that's remained strong after a hundred years. You can't prove one. Okay, next question. Do we need government permission to meet at home? Well, before I answer that question, let me just, uh, I better check my license here to make sure that doing this video, you know, vid my video ministry license is up to date. And oh, that's right, I, I read my Bible this morning and I forgot to call the government and ask their permission. Oh, and, and if you're praying, you better ask government permission before you pray. I mean, before the meal. You better make sure that the government, you, that you have a license to pray for your food. You see how absurd this is? You know, the, one of the things that the, the Babel building people, they'll throw at you is they'll say, Ran your your Caesar, the things that are Caesar's, and unto God, the things that are God's. They usually don't do the second part. They'll just say, Ran your your Caesar, the things that are Caesar's. Oh, well, then you have a Roman building, do you? Caesar was Roman. But, of course, we don't have Caesar's anymore. We have the Pope in Rome. But uh, not that they would worship him or anything. Oh, no. No, the, the fact of the matter is when they throw render unto Caesar on, to you, when they, when they throw that at you, just ask them a very simple question. Is the church of the living God, the church that's mentioned here in the New Testament, is it Caesar's or God's? You see, Romans chapter 13 I'll just turn here real quick in my Bible so I can read this to you. Romans 13 tells you what the purpose of government is. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Okay. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Now look at this. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Is uh, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ evil? No. At least not to a just government. Um... Worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ is a good thing. And therefore, Congress is to make no law regarding the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You say, well, that sounds like a neat saying there, Brian. Where'd you get that from? The First Amendment to the Constitution. Our government's purpose, according to the Word of God, any government's purpose is to execute wrath upon them that do evil. Somebody comes up and they say, I'm going to rob your house. I'm going to rob you. There's a police officer over there and he sees it. It's his job, his duty to protect me, the innocent. Okay? Somebody robs a bank. Somebody goes and they kill somebody. Somebody, whatever. Any evil thing that happens, it is the law's job to punish that evildoer, according to the Bible. Where in there does it say anything about the government having the right to tell you how to worship the Lord? Where in there does it say anything about the government having the right to tell you about health care or to regulate the kind of food that you eat, that you put in your mouth, or telling you how to educate your children? The government has no right in those matters. The government, according to Bi the Bible, is there to protect you from the evil, protect our borders from other countries coming in and invading us and, and doing us harm. That's the purpose of government. So when people say, well, you should have the government permission, and if, you're not, if you don't have government, government permission to worship the Lord as a church, then you're not legitimate. You're bad. You're, you're a, a tax evasion and fraud and all this other stuff. You're dealing with somebody that is working for the government. They have no authority over the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. None. Okay?
And an interesting thing that you can study if you want to, look up the term um, uh, by what authority. I talked about that in one of my recent videos. By what authority. Okay, type that in or look that up in, in your King James Bible. You'll see that the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, the high priests, were going to, coming to Jesus and they were saying, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? See? The fact is, and, and of course it went into the book of Acts and they were having the same thing thrown at them. The high priests are coming and saying to the early Christians, by what authority are you doing these things? See, the issue here is not what the Bible says. Okay, because honestly, the secular government doesn't care about what your beliefs are. The secular government wants to control the churches. That's why they have their IRS and corporation. Okay, and they control most of what you say from the pulpit. Why? Because they gave you a license. You know, you're no longer free when you have a license. Think about that. You say, well, Brian, how do I start a house church? Um, well, brethren, how did you read your Bible this morning? You open up and you read it. You didn't get anybody's permission to read the Bible, did you? Why would you get somebody's permission to start your church, the house church? I mean, you know, you're out there, you're in an area, you've gone to all the different Babel buildings in the area, they're all corrupt, they're all rotten. And, and not, ju not just, well, I don't like the color of the carpet. I'm talking doctrine. The guy up in the, in the pulpit is preaching out of a book he doesn't even believe in. There's all kinds of immodesty. There's the music is getting worldly. It's just social club. It's just all the things that Babel buildings are plagued with. And you just get sick and tired of it. And you say, you know what? I'm learning so much through the internet. I'm, I'm on fire for the Lord. I want to do something for the Lord. And it's like everybody at the local Babel buildings is dead spiritually. Nobody wants to track. Nobody wants to talk about the things of the Lord. I'm sick of it. What do you do? Green and bear it. Because you got to be part of a local church. No, you don't do that. You look and you say, Hey, are there any, is there anybody else out there that wants to be fervent for the things of the Lord? Let's meet together. Let's start a house church. Or here's another idea. Go out and actually start to evangelize the lost. And you lead somebody to Christ and you say, Hey, would you like to meet together sometime? I'll, I'll give you a Bible and I'll, I'll teach you what I know about the Bible. And you go and you're teaching that person about the Bible and everything. And all of a sudden you, they say, hey, guess what? I led somebody to the Lord. Well, great. That's wonderful. Let's go meet with them. And you go meet with them. And then, you know, and see, next thing you know, you have a good group. And you say, oh, then we can get together and have social things and have social functions and spaghetti dinners and, and, you know, no, 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 no. That's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to evangelize the lost. That's what it's about. And one of the quickest ways to kill yourself spiritually and to be dead spiritually is to be part of a local Babel building. Next thing you know, you're going to be cleaning toilets on Saturdays, mowing the lawn on Saturdays doing the nursery Sunday morning. Um, I read a whole thing about uh, this Jack Hiles deal. Um, I, I keep saying I want to come out with a study on Jack Hiles, and I'm trying to find the research on this. And it's like, there's a whole lot of stuff that's being covered up and, and uh, just incredible. But I, I read a whole thing about these people that were there, part of Jack Hiles' cult, and they were just like, for us to be faithful members, they, they had to forsake their family life. They were just there all the time. And that's what these battle buildings will do. They will, they will just destroy any free time that you have. But uh, anyhow, enough on that. We'll go to the next question. Go ahead. What's the next question? How do we evangelize the lost without a church building? <laughs> well, you can't. You gotta, you gotta go out and get a mortgage for a million dollar building and fill it full of, you know, expensive plush seats for the people to sit in and and gold plates to pass around the offering, you know, and stuff like that and try to pay it off. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And a million dollar, works. yeah, a million dollar building, a million dollar building to to bring in the lost so we can get their money to pay off the building. We like, come on, why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, <clears throat> how do you evangelize the lost without a building? Oh, gee, let's see. Um, how do they do it in the book of Acts? Uh, there are so many ways to evangelize the lost brethren. Uh, witnessing to people on the job site and, and you know, 
you, you don't you want to blow people's minds go up to some lost person and start witnessing to them and and you know if the lord gives you an opportunity start to witness to them and they say oh well you know i don't i don't really i'm not really interested and you say well let me just tell you something if you ever get saved make sure to stay away from church buildings okay it will blow their mind every time they'll they'll be like yeah okay wait. huh what did you just say it'll give you a door of opportunity you know i had a, I had a brother do that the one time he was telling me and he said he this guy came out and he was mad you know and i mean he was my buddy was putting tracks on the windshields another thing that you can do putting gospel tracks on windshields and this guy comes out take that thing off my car and he takes it off and he's like he's like take this he's like get don't do this you know i don't want you in my neighborhood doing this and and my friend said okay he said well i was just trying to tell people about salvation the guy's like i have i've i've heard enough of that and i don't want anything to do with it and he goes okay well he said um if you ever decide to get saved make sure you don't go to church and he said the guy was like yeah what did and he just stopped and he said what did you say <laughs> and my friend was like i said if you ever get saved don't go to church and he was like i thought that's what you said and he's like what are you talking about and he was like well the fact of the matter is the bible says that the church is the people it's a personal relationship with jesus christ and these buildings that are around here they're just going to get you in to get your money and he got the witness to the guy the guy didn't get saved but the point is you know that, that we know of anyhow i mean maybe it was a seed that was planted but the fact of the matter is people in america and and you know in other countries too the uk and and of course other countries People have this preconceived notion that salvation means you got to get a suit and tie and go to church someplace. That you got to dress up nice and go and be part of the, the pageant every week. And people are going, I've heard so many stories coming out of them places. I've, meet, I've met people from this and everything else. I don't even want anything to do with it. So Christianity has taken on a very uh, negative connotation. Why? Because of these battle buildings. So again, how do you evangelize the lost? Oh boy, let me count the ways. Gospel tracting. You can put them in, in stores, on the shelves, on benches where people sit. You can go up and say, here, here's something for you to read. Would you like a track? Or we don't say track because then they're like, uh, you know, would you like a little book to read? You know, would you like something to read while you're waiting for the bus or whatever? You can do all kinds of things like that. You know, you can get these little aluminum gospel coins and you can put them around places and things. I mean, the possibilities are endless you know and if you have a a small house church again get a little p.o box or something like that you can put your p.o box on the back of your gospel tracks lay them around okay let people contact you through that way you know if you really feel so inspired you can put your phone number on the back of the thing although that's you know can be iffy because then they can look up your address and if they're nuts then they can get there and be careful um you can go out do street preaching i mean th there are so many things when you're not tied to the building when you're not having to keep the the lawn mowed and keep the the thing vacuumed and keep the toilets clean and all the other stuff brethren don't be tied to a building and again what are you doing when you're saying to the lost hey would you like to know jesus as your savior well come out to our preaching event this weekend what if they go and learn how to get part of the pageant there but never truly get saved all right, let's go on to the next question. What about a house church wedding? Okay, what about a house church wedding? Parentheses um, SML. Yeah, um, another another good thing that comes up is people say, "What do you do when you want to get married, and you're part of a house church?" Well, uh, my wife and I got married as, you know, when we were had our house church down there in Pennsylvania, and the fact is, I mean, we didn't we kept it very very small. You don't have to do that. You can have a lot of people come over. You can go out to a public place somewhere. There are, are fire halls that you can rent or, or whatever else. Again, see, it goes back to this Catholic thing of you have to have the official cathedral with all the big production. And you end up spending thousands of dollars. And it's either your debt or your parents' debt. Why? For what? And, of course, you know, the other thing, too, you have the state marriage license issue, which... I really recommend a marriage coverture. In the front of your Bible, it'll say about uh, marriages or whatever. This one doesn't. This is my Cambridge Bible. But, you know, you can get a um, common man's reference Bible, and it has a marriage coverture in the front, and you get the 
two witnesses, the father of the bride, the father of the groom, and you get some other witnesses there, men that have seen this thing come to be, and, and, and there you go. That's your certificate. It's a, and see, again, tempted to go off on a really big rant here, but the fact of the matter is a state marriage license is what? Permission from the state. And they can control you then through that. Now they can control the children that you have because you're licensed after all to be married. So you go and you have children and then you get birth certificates for them and then you get social security numbers for them and you, you get all this stuff and pretty soon they have control over you. And it's just like if you get, do a, a coverture and you want to get divorced, you can't get divorced. I mean, you can't go to the state and say, we would like to get divorced. They're going to say, okay, where's your marriage license? See, they can give the license. They can also exchange it for a divorce papers. But when you have a coverture, that's what my wife and I have. I am her spiritual covering. I can't leave her. I can't just say, hey, you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm walking away. I'm her spiritual covering. See, totally different thing. And, you know, it's something that you're just going to have to research. I mean, I can't provide all the information on it. And, you know, you say, well, is that legal? Will my county recognize it? Probably not. Probably not. The same thing as if you go in and you say, I would like to legally know how I can start a house church. Don't do that. Okay? Just the same as you don't go in to, the, to your local courthouse and say, I would like your permission to read my Bible in the morning. You know? Why would you do a thing like that? Even if they give you permission, it's going to be permission that allows them to control you. See, we've gotten so far away from the biblical ideals of there are certain things that you submit to the government for. Pay your taxes. There's a speed limit on this road. Go to the speed limit. You know, not a problem. But when it comes to things like marriage, raising children, worshiping the Lord, reading the Bible, witnessing, all those things, the government has no right to be in that business. None. None at all. And you say, what if I get in trouble? Well, then you'd probably be able to have a fellowship with the Christians in the first century when you get to heaven. And the Lord. Yeah, and the Lord. Yeah, exactly. You'd have something in common with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Yeah. And again, getting back to the original subject, how do you do a marriage? Well, you'd have your elder or elders, depending on how large a size of group you have, you'd have the leadership of your house church basically you know, saying, okay, is this marriage coming together? Is this going to be a spiritual covering? Brother, are you going to be her spiritual covering? Oh, you know, yes. And, you know, and you talk it over and everything. And uh, make sure it's not just some kind of a thing that you get this thing done so that you can go fornicate or something. That's wrong. When you take on a, a, a spiritual covering, you know, when you, when you get a marriage coverture, that is very, very, very serious. Very serious. Far more serious than a state marriage license. Okay? But when you do that, you say, okay... Um, you talk to both parents, and again, you know, if you have lost, you know, the, the wife she saved, but her parents are lost or something, and they're not for it, well, you can't just say, well, then we can't get married until her parents are for it or something. Again, that's, it's a whole other issue. But, you know, if, if it gets to a point where one of the two, their family doesn't agree with it, well, then just have an elder, another elder of, of that local congregation say, okay, I'll give my uh, written consent here to this, that I was here present to see this, this union of brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. And then you get some of the other men of the, of, the, of the church there, and I don't mean the building, I mean the body of believers. You get some of the other brethren to say, okay, they give their consent to it, and you get married. And then you live together, and uh, that's going to be that. So... Next question. What about a funeral? Okay. Again, we go back to this thing of legality and all this other stuff. And, and uh, you know, I know that there are different states, there are different laws and things like that. And, and some places they say, well, you can bury on your property and you have to get a permit and all this. Again, we're going back to the same thing. And, you know... I believe that if you have private property someplace and one of the saints dies, well, bury them on your private land. And uh, I just, I feel that that's the way it should be done. I don't, again, what's the government doing regulating where somebody gets buried? 
But uh, you say, what about the funeral service? Well, again, rather than, why do you have to have a million dollar building or $500,000 building? I mean, look up the prices of these Babel buildings. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not, I'm not trying to make it look bad, you know, whatever. I'm talking these things are expensive. Why do you have to have something like that for the possibility of a wedding or the possibility of a funeral? Why? You know, have some place. Do like they did in the old days. There's the grave site. Everybody gets together around the old grave site. Somebody stands up, reads the Bible, gives a little salvation message, and they bury them. See, again, a lot of this stuff, it's just kind of like, you know, um, I'll just give you an example. The property right here, you know, our road going back in. You know, we had to spend an insane amount of money, and we were deceived on that, to get back into our land. And, you know, to have the, the road built here across this river behind me. And you say, well, uh, you didn't have an option, though. You weren't able to get back in there before that. Uh, you know, because you, you couldn't take your vehicle back, could you? No, but we walked back. You see, what were we doing? Asking for the old paths. Oh, we can't take our vehicle back and have the nice comfort of being in a nice vehicle. What do you do then? Walk. You know, I know that's difficult for some people to imagine, you know, but... <laughs> and modern yeah. terminology of that is called thinking outside of the box. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, again, what do you do? You, you say, well, I, I, I don't have permission to do this, or I don't have permission to do that, or whatever. Where are we going to seat 200 people or something like that? Rent some chairs, pick a good sunny day, have your funeral outside. Well, how are we going to dig out the, the grave and stuff like that? With shovels? See? And see, you know, but, but there's, there's so many other things involved. Yes, because we're, we're at the end of the church age. And there's been so many things that have been done wrong for so long, it's hard to get back to the way it was done right. But that doesn't mean you forget the way it was done right. See, again, you know, is it worth having a million dollar property just so you can take care of a funeral? No, no. You talk about an incredible waste of money. I mean, look at this right here. Cambridge Bible, all right? This thing cost me $110 um, over 10 years ago. I don't even remember the year I bought this thing. $110. You say, man, that's an expensive Bible. Yeah, it is. How many of these could you buy for the cost of a Babel building? Do the math on that one, okay? And, you know, I'm not even recommending buying Cambridge's. I mean, you could, you could buy a highest quality local church Bible publishers King James Bible for everybody in your entire town and still not even come close to the cost of a Babel building. Why waste the money on it? Okay, next question. How do house churches handle finances? Okay, another good question. Uh, there are different ways to do that. Um, originally when we had our house church we started out with um, a little offering box and we had it in another room from where we would worship and anybody at all could go put cash in it or check in it or whatever else and then that would be deposited into um, like the deacon into their bank account and then if we had to buy tracks or we had to buy DVDs or we had to buy whatever then they would buy that okay now that's one way that you can do that and again you, you know people say well we have to report that to the government did they report it to the government in the Bible when they made collection for the poor saints, which were at Jerusalem, and Paul's like, you know, see that when you, when you meet on the first day of the week, make your collection then that there be no gatherings when I come, you know. Or when I get there, I'm going to need to get that money to take it to the poor saints over here. There wasn't any reporting to the government. And it's not about, oh, that's tax evasion. That's, that's fraud. That's, no, it isn't. It's saying, hey, I'm working at such and such a job. I pay my taxes there. But my church that I'm part of, the body of believers that I'm part of, we don't report to you, government. Why? Because we're not under the government. We are under the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, another way that you can do it um, is you can have a list of things that are needed. Okay? Instead of actually having an offering box and then the money being put into whatever, this is another idea you can do. A list of things that you need. Say, um, we need somebody to buy 2,000 Fellowship Track League gospel tracks for our tracting 
event that we're going to have coming up here. Okay. All right. Um, another thing on the list, we need a copy machine for um, copying our literature that we send out to people. Another thing on the list, you say, uh, we're going to do a, a gospel tract um, uh, letter distribution thing. We're just going to get a phone book. We're going to go down through and send gospel tracts to everybody in the phone book. You know, and uh, so we need money for envelopes. We need somebody to buy the envelopes. We need somebody to buy the stamps. And then volunteer your time. Come on, everybody get together. Put the tracks in, put, you know, construction paper around them so they can't look at it and see it and throw it out, you know. Um, whatever. There, see, there are things like that, expenses that you might have. And then, you know, there was even a case where we had a, a brother and sister that, that had a, a real bad situation and they really were hurting for money. And so we came together as our little local body of believers there and we said, let's send them $1,500. And we did. You know, so, see, there are different ways that you can handle finances, but you're not uh, having to worry about a mortgage. Or, uh, well, you don't have to do property tax because it's uh, government, you know, run and government owned. Um, you don't want that. Okay, stay away from the buildings. Next question. How can we organize with other believers? Okay, how can you organize with other believers? Well, we have two websites now. Not my websites, but some of the brethren have put up two different websites. I have a video on that, and I'll put the link to it here. And the these two different websites, um, they allow different um, house churches in different areas to organize with other believers. If you want to check out and see if there's one in your area, you can get in contact with them. Um, there again, um, initially, if you have people contact you, you have a house church, house fellowship there and you have people contact with you meet them in a public place don't just say come on in because you don't know what you're going to get and i mean there were there were cases where we had people we'd go meet with them and everything and, and there again take two people from your house church don't go by yourself if you're an elder or whatever you know do not go by yourself two people okay and if it's a woman that's saying, I'd like to contact you, and you say, what about your husband? Well, he doesn't want to come or whatever. Okay, then you take a man and a woman, not two men. Okay, very important. You have to protect yourself that way. Uh, they went out by twos in the New Testament. All right, Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, you know, by twos. So, um, <clears throat> but what you do is you say, okay, you get an email, you get a phone call, you get a letter, you get whatever, and they say, I want to come be part of your house church. All right, you say, okay, well, when would it suit us to be able to come and meet with you? You know, the Bible talks about him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. And we had this one guy the one time, and he came, and, and he was, oh, yeah, I believe what you guys believe and everything else. He shows up. We're talking to him. He turns out to be a hyper-Calvinist and a post-tribulation nut. And the guy was nuts. And it was just like, okay. And I told him, I said, sorry, you can't fellowship with us. What? You got, you're, you're not allowing me to fellowship? I said, no, no. You're weak in the faith, and you have doubtful disputations. If you were just weak in the faith and willing to learn, that'd be fine. But you have doubtful disputations. You're going to dispute with the other brethren. So why are we going to bring you in? You know. So be careful about that. But uh, there are different ways that you can organize. Of course, through your tracting, through your witnessing, through your evangelism, you get somebody saved. Now, it doesn't have to be, hey, come over on Sunday from 9 to 12. You go to that person, you say, you just got saved. Can we come and meet with you? What, what day would suit you? Well, Tuesday evening after 6 o'clock, you know, we'd be done with supper by then, and you can come over and fellowship with us a little bit, you know. My wife and, actually, my wife and I actually were at a um, family's house last night doing that very thing. And we were there for, what was it, three and a half hours? Yeah. About that, yeah. Yeah. Three and a half hours. Reading the Bible, quoting Scripture, back and forth. What do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? You know, well, what do you think about this? What do you think the Bible says about that? And then, da, 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 da. yeah. See, there's a lot of that stuff that goes on off camera, and I don't talk about that all. You know, and a lot of people think, oh, he's just on YouTube. He doesn't do anything privately. Well, yes, we do. You know, and see, true house church Christians are active in ministry and trying to lead people to the Lord. And when you lead them to the Lord, you don't say. Come down to church and sit there for 
three months before you learn anything because you only have a half hour of learning each Sunday. No. You come down and you say, do you have a Bible? Do you have a King James Bible? Oh, you don't? Okay, we'll bring one for you. You come, you bring a King James Bible, you say, okay, now here's a good thing on, uh, you know, here's some good tracks on eternal security. Here's some, a good book on such and such. They say, what's this thing about creation science? Say, ah, I don't have the DVDs with me. I'll bring them next week. Do you have a DVD player? Okay, I'll bring them again. In fact, if you're going to be here tomorrow night, I'll bring them tomorrow night. See? It's so important when somebody gets saved to get in there and disciple them very quickly. Give them the information. You don't say, come to the battle building and, and, you, and over to the next 10 years you're going to learn what you should learn. No, don't do that. Get the truth to them. Okay, next question. Should anyone be welcomed in? Well, now, see, I went and already covered that one. <laughs> uh, should anyone be welcomed in? No, no. Um, there again, you know, and, and, and see, now here's another interesting thing about house churches. What if you have somebody say brother so-and-so and his uh, cousin is lost, but he'd like to see how a house church is run. Should you have a lost person come into a house church if they're a relative? I would say, yeah, if they're a relative. And, but it shouldn't be, let's have a special, let's have just a regular old servant. Have them come in and say, you know, do you know anything about the Lord or whatever? Talk to them. You know, house churches are supposed to be informal, all right? And, you know, if they say, well, could I come back next week? Well, we need to talk to you about that. Coming one time is different than regular fellowship. So if it's a, it's a, if it's a relative that, you know, now if I had a relative, I remember the one time we had some relatives come up and they were extreme liberal and modern church Christians and stuff like that. And I was like, we're not going to meet here this week. We'll meet at brother so-and-so's house. You know, and we went someplace else because they were visiting other relatives where we normally met. So I was like, nope, we're not going to go there. You know, so him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. If you have somebody that's going to come in and, and doubt your stands that you take and, and start to question and be a royal pain, and they're not, they're not, you know, they're not coming in and saying, hey, I have a sincere question here. You know, they're, they're coming and saying, you're wrong and I'm going to prove you wrong and you're a heretic and whatever else. Bye-bye. Okay, next question. One pastor or elders? One pastor or elders? Well, I used to always take stands for the one pastor thing, and then I had some brethren correct me on that, show me you know, the fact that there should be multiple elders for safety. Again, um, you have one man running the show, and you put him into a building where he can get 20,000 people coming on a Sunday. You have a cult, an empire. That guy can build an empire. Um, you know, it's a real bad situation. Uh, now, you say, so then we should have multiple elders, but how does that work if we're just starting a house church? Well, it won't. See, if, you, if you're saved right now, and you're a man, and you're studying the, the Word of God, and you feel God calling you to evangelize the lost, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to get out there, witness to people, and if the Lord allows you to lead somebody to Him, and He gets saved, then you can start to teach Him, and when He gets to that point of, okay, now, he knows the Word of God. Now, okay, now he's another elder. Now, you keep him in check, he keeps you in check. So that neither of you gets puffed up to too high of a position. That's very important. And as the group grows up and grows and grows and grows, now you say, okay, Brother John, Brother Sam, I want you, Brother Sam, you take this group here, you take these five families, and you go over there. And you meet over that way. Brother John, you go over there. And you train up those men to bring them up to the level of pastor. You know, we, we have this funny notion that Christians should just sit around and just, you know, if you're, if you're in a church building, you know, a Bible building for 60 years, and you're a nice guy and tell good jokes, that's a successful Christian. No, that's a failure. Okay? Every man, the Bible talks about the priesthood of the believer. Okay? Now, I grant you that there are men that are given the responsibility of being overseers. I, I believe in that. But it should be the desire of every man to come up to that position. But you say, well, then how does it work? If, if you have 100 men in a congregation and they're all elders, how does that work? That's the point. You shouldn't have 100 men in a congregation. They should be spreading out. Again, the local church philosophy, 
this church building, Bible building philosophy is if you don't have a good local church in your area, you better move to one, brother. That's Catholic. Yeah. That mentality is Catholic Jesuit doctrine. Yeah. yeah. And so it makes a problem. And so you have all these little Christian pilgrimages, you know, going to this place and to that place. You know, I remember that uh, I went to see Dr. Peter S. Ruckman the one time down in uh, Smyrna, actually, Delaware. And um, we were there. There were people there from Rhode Island, you know, driving 12, 14 hours through the night to get to see Ruckman. You know, it's like, okay, you know. <laughs> uh that's a little far to drive, but whatever, you know. You just go around seeing the celebrity preachers as they come and repeat the same sermon over and over again. Next question. <laughs> 